All right, welcome back, episode Trey three already. Yeah, live here from the standard, the standard. at the Smith House. That's right. Thank you again for the hospitality, and yeah. we're 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 back at it again with episode three. We are. Let's jump right into it. All right. Tell me all about the TPE show, Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah. So, um, you know, we had a big fundraiser for our nonprofit Oz Arts the night before. Okay. Which was great. And the next morning, I hopped on like a 6 a.m. flight. Brutal. Brutal. Yeah. To go straight to Vegas. I get in there at like 8 something. And uh, and then I go straight to the uh, the TPE floor. Like our guys are like, make sure that they drop you off at the south entrance. <laughs> I had a guy who is an Uber driver from Cuba. Oh, no. <laughs> of course. Oh, no. <laughs> He's like, hello, how are you? Oh, no. Oh, he, didn't, he didn't understand he didn't English very well. It, was it the same venue so, as PCA or, or different? Different, different, different. Okay, okay. So then he dropped. It's at the Las Vegas Convention Center. All right. So when he dropped me off, pillars he said, in the middle of yeah, the floor. Yeah, I put in it's... south, you know, south entrance. Right. In you know the the, the Uber app, mm-hmm. and it dropped me off like where it saw where it supposedly was a south entrance, and still had to walk a mile oh, to go. Geez. So he dropped me off at the wrong place. Great. So, but at least I got no some, tip I for got, you. I no got tip some for steps you. in though, right? There so, you go. so I get over there. We walk in, and then they say. Stay on the red carpet is like the premium cigar booths. Okay. And the blue carpet is everything else. So I get to where our booth and, is. And the green carpet is the weed and the CBD and all that, right? They didn't have okay. a green carpet. Oh, I they did. Think. I think it was just right. blue and red. Blue and so red. I dropped off my bags and then I started, I was like, what the hell? Why don't I just explore this? Yeah. So I go walking straight in, and pretty soon I'm So in you like, didn't stay on the red carpet. You no. went you went blue. Yeah, I dropped it off okay. and I started with the red and it was red for just a, a smidge. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it went into the blue carpet area. And then there are all these like C B D weed kind of uh companies. <laughs> And I mean, like it hadn't opened yet the show technically, but people were still getting ready to like already. They're soliciting me to like, I'm like, what kind of badge do I have on it? Oh my god! It's just an exhibitor on it, but uh, but they had so much CB. I was shocked at the volume of, I don't know, you call it new age products. You know what I mean? That Alternative like, or al- whatever, or yeah. whatever the category yeah, yeah. is called. It was just staggering, overwhelming, yeah. unbelievable. Um, that industry blew up. Yeah, I mean, like I've actually in, in, invested in a company called Canvas, and they they do CBD right, yeah. and and stuff like that too. Very high quality. Mm-hmm. They weren't there, but I mean, the amount of like companies was like shocking. So then I went back, and then people told me they're like, yeah, actually, the premium cigar segment of the whole floor is like one small little red dot, mm-hmm. and the whole rest of it is all the other stuff. is all the other stuff. But they said that the cigar segment was growing. And, um, you know, there were a lot of retailers that were there from, like, the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Like, so there were a lot of California retailers I saw, um, some from Arizona and some from uh, Nevada. I mean, obviously, we're in Nevada. Uh, but that was the majority of them. I didn't see – there were some retailers, actually, that came from, like, Pennsylvania, from the Northeast, um, some. And, and you know, Harry came. From New York. From New York. Yeah. Shout so out I saw Harry. I saw yeah, Harry over at Harry's Habana Hut in uh in Queens. Um so I mean it was and I asked Harry, like, for example, like why he liked to go to it, and he said he he liked it because he, he felt it was more kind of boutique oriented and he felt like he could get a little bit more sort of um conversation time with people and see what's new or what's more boutique that's happening. But within the, the premium cigar sector so you got some big players out there, like Drew Estate, right? Yeah, uh-huh. they they must have had a massive booth, right? Yeah, they had they, they had, had a big, um, they had a big booth that yeah. they had a DJ. We were right near them, so okay. you know they had a nice booth for yeah. sure. Um, Who and else? then they had uh, Generals out there, Altidus, maybe. Yeah, they had General out there. They had Altidus out there. I wasn't really kind of quite clear on. They had this one area that seemed like it was a bunch of. Um, like if if you had a brand that was a smaller brand or smaller brands, you could you could share this one yeah. space. Okay, which that seemed like a good idea because you could walk into the space and then there were like all these pedestals with different kind of brands on the top of the pedestals, and you could see what they were offering. Um, like boutique island or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was a good idea. Um, but overall, I mean, it wasn't like the same size as the PCA. But from no. what I read afterwards, that. It was kind of gaining in momentum and traction, and it, it has been over the years. Of... It's been slowly growing and growing, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's something to watch for sure. We had a little bit of a fiasco behind the scenes while you guys were en route, so this is part of the thing that people don't see. But 
we had we had done two custom displays, each ten by ten, right? Mm. And that was going to be the backdrop for our twenty mm. foot by twenty foot booth. One was Crown Heads, one was Osgner Family Cigars, right? And I walk into the office like two days before the show's supposed to start, and Thaddeus and Shipping tells me um, they're missing one of the displays. Miguel just called me. I'm like. Please, God, let it be the crown heads one that did not make it. Because if Tim goes out there and he doesn't see the OFC display, <laughs> he ain't going to be happy. And so then I'm like, let me know which one it is. And I'm just, sure as hell. It was the OFC one that was missing. Well, that's all right. I mean. So, but then it gets better. So then Thaddeus is like, okay, I'm going to just drive over to the, the the hub at White's Creek, which is not too far from our office. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask somebody to find the damn thing because it's got to be in the warehouse. And I'm like, bro, they ain't going to do nothing for you. And he did, and then they said, no, you got to come back at 2 o'clock. So then he goes back at 2 o'clock. He said, this lady could not have been more useless. She was like, I, she goes, apparently they scanned it, but it didn't get delivered. And he's like, I know, that's what I just told you. It's here in the warehouse. It never made it on the outbound, you know, truck, airplane, whatever. She's like, he, she goes, can, can somebody just go look for it? And he, she goes, do you see the size of this warehouse? And yeah. she's like, that ain't going to happen. Literally, just like that. And so yeah. anyway, so he came back and then. I ended up texting Adam, who was on vacation, and I said, dude, I need your help. Who, where did we get these displays from? I need one. Because we had the big smoke coming up right behind yeah, it, yeah. right? Are we going to get that in time for yeah, that? we're going to get that in time because Adam texts me back. It's 4.45 my time. He says, by the way, this company closes at 5 o'clock Central Standard Time, so you got 15 minutes. So I just looked for the phone number, called them, da-da-da-da-da-da. You got to get this in production. Here's my Amex, whatever, boom, boom, boom. So they, it's it's going to be there. All right, time. thank God. But, so yeah, so these are the little hoops that we jump through behind the scenes. Yeah, but yeah. What a what a you know. Well, I I mean, we had basically a backdrop for for crowned heads. You know, yeah, what but I mean? it didn't but, look but, like but what I mean, we. Yeah, you know, you know but but uh, yeah, it's I one mean, of those it, things that what could go wrong. I mean, we never miss shipments. We never get things lost. It figures the one time we have a, a trade show. Yeah, well, I guess you just lost, sort so. of live and learn, and then. You know, yeah, it's, it feels like the it feels like the show is definitely a, a growing show. Makes it fun, and, you know. Yeah, I mean, we haven't really looked at the the numbers, so we're still kind of getting orders coming in, and mm -hmm. you know, but um, it's it's a fraction of what we'll do in July in Vegas at PCA. But now they're talking about moving the PCA in 2024 to April, April yeah. right, and then pushing the TAA, which is our next trade show, back into October. Which why be, is that? I don't know, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if it's a contractual thing for the city that they're looking at. They may be looking at New Orleans in 24. I don't know. Huh. Um, which it all sounds well and good because, you know, then you don't have the 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 PCA in the middle of the summer where it's hot, like either in Vegas, New Orleans, or whatever. It sounds great. But then on our end for, for product development, we've got to back everything up even further and start working out further for 2024 now if we want to get things ready by April. Although it does logically July. make sense to me that if people are going to be coming and buying at, you know, in the summer, like in July or August, they're buying for the, you know, their third and fourth quarters. Yeah, you'll get that, more terms. And that makes sense. Right. Right. So um, if they do it in April, well, I mean, I guess you could look at it in the way of that, you know, when the weather gets better, then people are going to be smoking more cigars right. because they can smoke hypothetically outdoors more you know they're just there are just more opportunities to smoke cigars when the weather is clears up it'll be an adjustment though because i mean historically we've always planned product right. development out to release in summer and now you got to yeah. back it up another what three or four months but it still seems like to have something that people are buying for the third and fourth quarter makes sense it does and you'll get more turns on our side we'll get more turns if we get the product right. on time so but there's like, not going to be anything in the summer for an opportunity for so in 24, retailers to buy product? 24 TPE will be end of January. In theory, PCA should be in April. TAA will be in October. So there's nothing in between all of that. But Maybe TPE should consider moving to the summer if, so if that's the case. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, like this cigar that I'm smoking now, this is a blend, the most recent version of it that I started on a project with Ernie, Ernesto Perez Carrillo, back in the middle of last year. Uh -huh. And now it's going to be hopefully ready for PCA this year. So now if I wanted to do something with him in theory, I would have already had to start working on it for 2024 April, mm. you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it kind of pushes things back a little yeah. bit, you know yeah. what I mean? But we'll What see. is that that you're smoking now? So you were talking so about this, new product. Uh, yeah, I, I would, would love to share more about it. But, I mean, we literally started with this. I had the idea 
for the brand with Ernie. Um, and it was based off of a Buena Vista social club connection tie-in type of a thing. And I pitched the idea to him and I said, I wanted to make the cigar reminiscent of XYZ blend that you used to do back in the 90s. And he's like all about it and everything. So we started playing with blends, going back and forth. I worked on the packaging with Wade and, and I thought we had the packaging right. I thought we had the blend right. And then Ernie's mm -hmm. like, no, I'm not happy with the blend. I, okay, we started over again. So it, very long story short, shorter. Um, so we've gone through probably six versions of the blend and I'm on my fourth version of the packaging now because we had to scrap each version of the package. I thought I had the packaging and he's like, no, I don't like it, bro. And I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, I want everybody to be happy with it. So we're oh, on. Ernie didn't like it. Ernie didn't like it. Oh. Huh. So when uh, the Chingasso talks, you listen. You know what I mean? Right. right. So you you uh, you got to make sure he's happy with it as well. So, um, yeah, it's, hopefully we're on track to get it for PCA. But it's, I can tell you that the wrapper is uh, this Jalapa wrapper that he used on uh, his Encore. Encore. Yeah, yeah. Which ironically, so going back to 2016, we're sitting at a, at a PCA uh, meeting thing or whatever, and I'm sitting with Mike and Ernie. Ernie gives me a sample of a cigar. He says, let me know what you think of this. And I was like, man, this is amazing. You know, what is this? And um, he says, yeah, he goes, it's something I've been playing with. It's, it's Jalapa wrapper, but I don't think it's ready yet. And so he put a pause on it and didn't do anything with it. And I think he released it in 18, was Encore. Went on to be number one cigar. But in mm. the meantime, I said, if you're not going to use that wrapper, I want to use it. And we ended up using it on, um, I think it was either our TA exclusive or the Paniola, one of the two. But we ended up, we actually used that wrapper before Ernie used that mm -hmm. wrapper. Are you inspired so, by a lot of music? Does music kind of drive a lot of your it kind can. of blend Yeah, ideas? sometimes it can. For this one, it did. I, it basically, it was just kind of a time and a place of something I was going through professionally that also spoke to me with the, the cigar and, and it made sense. Um, but man, we've, we've done all kinds of different inspirations and everything like, like what was your inspiration for when you got back in, you know, with, with Bosphorus and OFC? Well, I mean, I always believe like, um, you know, I read this book by Simon Sinek, mm -hmm. uh, start with why. And so I feel like that that's important. Um, no matter what company that you're starting, whatever, whatever it is, is that like, why are you doing this? You know, what's, What's, what's important to you? What are your morals and ethics and that kind of thing? And so, I mean, the reason for me why to get back in it is that, you know, I loved kind of, I found that I loved the product. I love cigars. I love how it tastes. I love the nuance of it. I love combining different tobaccos. It's almost like uh, spices in your spice cabinet, right. putting them together to create kind of a dish. Um, so there's that. And then also like, you know, who are you at your core? And in our case, you know, the, the family history there's always, people always ask me like, you know, cause my given name was like Barat and, uh, it's a Turkish name mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, last name Osgener. So, I mean, uh, you know, people, and I changed my name to, to Tim because no one could pronounce Murat Osgener in Nashville, Tennessee right. when I was growing True. up. True story. I actually changed my name to Timmy because my best friend's name was Timmy. And and everybody like liked Timmy, so I was like, well, I'm I'm gonna be Timmy too. So and I how old are you when this happens? Kindergarten. I don't know how okay. old you're. Okay. Okay. So I changed my name in the cubby. I took a crayon with a masking tape, and I wrote Timmy with a backwards Y, and I put it over my name because the teacher wrote your name, you know. So she put like Murat Osgan, or I put Timmy over it. <laughs> and I remember I was gonna say, well, yeah. Came to pick me up, and he's like, I am here to pick up my son, Murat. They're like, who? They're like, that is him, the boy throwing sand in the other boy's face. That's my son. Uh, oh, you mean little Timmy? And they're like, Timmy, what the hell? You know, it's like, <laughs> so all my Turkish relatives were like, what is this name? To me, you have something caught in your teeth? To me, to me, to me. You know, Murat, that's a name. To me, it means you need a toothpick or something. So I was like, you know, so I couldn't win for losing, right? So that's how I got the name. Uh, uh, but he just let you go with it, though. John yeah, was cool yeah, with it. He's like, yeah, whatever. He let me go. So okay. anyway, so I have to explain anyway that, uh, uh, you know, Osgener, and they're like, okay, you know, my dad is Armenian, my mother Turkish. They met in New York, and they they fell in love, and they eloped, and then they came to Nashville because my mom went to get her PhD at, at uh, Peabody School of Education. Da, da, da. So I have to tell that story anyway. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a cool story, and I wanted to kind of convey it in the vista and on the band of the cigar. And then it comes about like, you know, how do you make a 
that's a complex story, so you want to make a complex blend that kind of mirrors that story. And therefore, I thought, you know, Ernesto is one of these cigar makers that can convey complexity through a blend and kind oh, of yeah. be an extension of the story. So, you know, that's kind of was... But before at CAO, as you know, I mean, we were blending around like what was the uh, interesting tobacco. And so if it was Brazilian, we would make it Brazilia. If it was, you know, Italian tobacco, we wanted to blend around, it would be Italia blend. I mean, so yeah, that's Yeah, it seemed you know, like back then it was more tobacco driven than story driven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really. And then right. now it's kind of the other. Yeah, it's what sort of is a story. That? I think they're I think they're messing with the sound system over here. Just okay, to like, or maybe All there's right. a ghost in here. That I don't could, know. That could be a possibility. This place too. is old enough to be. Supposedly, on, Andrew Jackson, I think, got married in front of something. I, apparently, he's listening to hip hop now because yeah. it just. I guess. I guess. But knows. you know what? I love to go back to Bosphorus. Is I'm I'm looking at the the vista, and you can kind of get lost in that vista, and you really can tell a story visually. Yeah. If you you know if you pay close enough attention to it, it's 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 like art. Well, I do that. I mean, I tell when I'm when I'm out like doing promotions, I'll mm-hmm. like talk very quickly about it because you want to be able to say like you know my dad's Armenian, mom Turkish, met in New York, eloped to the foothills of Tennessee, or in this case now Nashville's become bigger than just foothills. But um, but yeah, I mean it kind of like reinforces what it is that you're talking about when you're when you're doing that. Um, so it's interesting because we're kind of veered onto new product development and how do you kind of. How do you develop something? What are your inspirations? What's I mean, I, for me, I like things to be as authentic as possible. So I try to just go back to authenticity. One, two, you know, what are, what are people looking for in the market? Mm-hmm. So that's why I like going out and being in the market. So yeah, I like only. that you actually pay attention to what people, and I'm like the complete polar opposite. Like I, I will selfishly create blends with our factory partners solely based on what I like. And I feel like if somebody out there likes it, that's the bonus plan. Like I would never like, you know, go, okay, everybody likes this. I'm not that keen on it, but I'll go ahead and make it because you guys like it. I'm just the opposite. I'm like, and so far, knock on wood somewhere, you know, it's found an audience, some more than others. But um, it's, it's, it's an interesting path to take for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I don't know. I've always like kind of, uh, like being out there in the field so because then I can sort of try to listen and respond that's to smart. what it is that people kind of that's smart. are looking for or what they're what they're wanting or gravitating to. You yeah. Know? You just gotta listen to the right people. Otherwise you end up making a bunch of six by sixty and seven by seventy cigars. <laughs> it's just that's what sells in our store and da 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 da. It's just like Well, it's an aggregate thing. You just have yeah. to keep going and listening yeah. and then write notes and then listen and write notes and then look over the notes and see. So to this point in your journey back, like uh-huh. what have you found that what you're what are you feeling like people are, are asking you, like, yeah, I really like this. And is there a certain trend or a- Yeah. Well, that's a good question. It's like actually I was on a podcast like a few weeks ago and somebody said, you know, because I've been away from it for about 13 years. So mm-hmm. they were like, what have you noticed from being 13 years gone and coming back? So my initial response to that question was, I feel like consumers are much more educated on uh, tobaccos in general and cigars in general, which yes. is a good thing and, and a completely understandable thing because people can Google things or they can look at podcasts. Yeah. So like, for example, you started off talking about Jalapa and how that tastes. I mean, mm-hmm. nowadays people, they know what Jalapa is versus Esteli, more oh, yeah. so than they did 13 years ago. Because there's a curiosity, there's an appetite, and the information is more readily available out there. Correct. And people can go to stores and ask the retailer, or they can ask, you know, a visiting, you know, cigar manufacturer if they're doing an in-store event, for example. So uh, that's one thing that that I've picked up on. The other one is actually, um, because I thought about it more, is that um, I think it's important for... uh, um, and people are looking for places that they can go, environments they can go in mm-hmm. to smoke. Mm-hmm. So the stores need to be cognizant, in my view, of creating an ambiance or an environment that people want to go and smoke cigars in. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, people nowadays, they like being able to uh, pair with a cigar. Mm-hmm. That could mean coffee, that could mean bourbon, that could mean beer or wine. But people are interested in that and they use it as like kind of an opportunity to kind of unwind Mm -hmm. and gather socially with friends. So I think that's another huge kind of – and now that varies depending on the laws of the state. So for example, 
in Houston, I went and did an event at uh, Stogie's of Houston, beautiful store. And there they had it because of laws. They have a private membership that you pay, gives you access to uh, an area where you have lockers. And then lockers, people can, you know, BYOB mm-hmm. basically. But in other markets, such as like Phoenix, for example, they have a lot of cigar lounges. So you can go in there and you can buy a single malt, for example, or a bourbon or beer and, you know, or wine and smoke a cigar and and order it. Mm -hmm. They just have to have 51% of their business needs to be cigars. Right. So they have to, and they get, and they get checked a lot. So they have to like always make sure that, that their percentages are on for their, you know, relative to their sales. So it kind of depends on the market. But I do notice that that is something that people really like. They 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 like being able to go and, you know, have a beverage with your cigar. More of a social thing than than anything kind of. Yeah. The whole fraternity of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the leaf, whatever. Yeah, no, kind yeah. of like a safe, uh, refuge gathering place for people to go and and smoke. Mm-hmm. You know, so those are two kind of big differences that I've noticed. Um, what, what about in terms of like flavor profiles? Do you see more people gravitating towards fuller bodied cigars or they still, yeah. you know what I mean? Is there, is there a trend that you're seeing in well, that? Well, I mean, you know, look, I think that people are open-minded to try different things, which is, yeah. I think what's great in general about um, the United States and the U S market is that, uh, I mean, I even noticed this about myself. If I go to a store that is having a promotion on a spirit or a wine or a beer, I will be open to try it because I recognize that this person has taken, I can relate to it for me, the person has taken a lot of time and energy and effort to go there, Mm -hmm. um, to be there. And um, I think that that's worth honoring when people take the effort to do that. So therefore, I will try that product. And I mean, I think that for the most part, not 100% of the time, that uh, if, if I'm there doing an event, that I appreciate it when people like will take the time to at least try, you know, especially when you have a new cigar that you're introducing, you want people to try it. Hopefully they like it. If they like it, hopefully they, they buy more and take advantage of any sort of specials that we have there. Cause that's why we're there. Um, but I think that that's kind of, um, that's kind of what I've, I've, uh, I mean, answer your question of, as far as like mild, medium, full, it's sort of, Still, there are a lot of people that like milder cigars. So the fact that we have our Pie Synesthesia, which is like a mild to medium offering out there, people like that. Um, this one is more like medium to full, but there's nuances. Like the Churchill that I'm smoking now is a bit sweeter and milder mm-hmm. than the 5.5 by 55, which is interesting. I mean, to me, because I'm like yeah. smoking all the different ones because, you know, what are you doing all day when you're, you're like traveling with the guys yeah. or yeah. you're visiting stores, you're trying all the different sizes so you can pick up on the nuance. But, and and then there's some people that like, you know, more flavored cigars than I thought too. So, you know, it's it's kind of like a, uh, it's a mixed bag, but but you're out there and you're, you're, you're always looking and listening and watching what yeah. people are buying. So I would say it's kind of across the gamut. I don't find people... For the most part, the, the percentage of people that come in and say, I want a really kick-ass full-bodied cigar that's going to mm-hmm. knock me on my ass is small. I think so, too. I think, I, But I think like if for Crown Heads segment of the audience, it's more so. In other words, like we don't do well with mild to medium cigars. You know, I thought, come, I, I, for instance, like the PCA exclusive that we did in 22, this Fumato and C major, I was like, okay, let me... Let me try something different. Let me go back to a mild Connecticut kind of a thing that's just really enjoyable to smoke. And I really liked the blend, but it just, it literally tanked. You know what I mean? It's just because I figured, oh, okay, our audience wants something a little heavier, a little bit stronger, a little bit more in your face. So we couldn't get away with that as as well. Um, Well, it's a complicated uh, business, right? So, I mean, it's not like, um, it's usually not one thing. It's usually a combination of elements. Yeah. That uh, come together, uh, that make things kind of click or not, you know. Mm-hmm. I would say, um, but I mean, it's it's, I, I you know, that's the thing is that like I don't I don't find it's like usually like one one 
reason why things may work or not work. It's usually like a combination. There's a lot of, of intangibles. A combination of things that I agree. Have to come together to make it work, and it's not, you know. I mean, it's not a it's not an easy kind of thing to nail to put your finger on. No, you know? if we did, we'd all have joint anniversaries. You know, everybody would have a home run all the time. But so I know that you've been working on a new project, and this is probably going to air March tenth, I think, when I looked at my calendar. So we're taping this in advance, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we can't really divulge all the details. But by the time this goes live. We'll be a couple weeks away from a, an announcement. Yeah. What? Let's just dance around the topic and say, what were you looking for in terms of this new project, as far as flavor characteristics, as opposed to Bosphorus? Yeah. So I mean, like the 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 next one is going to be. I mean, it kind of ties in again with like kind of the storyline of this one being the Bosphorus is sort of like represents kind of a, a body of water that that goes between Europe and Asia and and is a bridge mm -hmm. to those two. So. We wanted this cigar to be one that if somebody likes a fuller bodied cigar or medium bodied or milder, they could enjoy no matter what your palate is. So it's widely accessible and we wanted to make the price point also an accessible price point. It's a good foundation. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. so the next one is similar. You know, we wanted to make that also like a uh, nice, rich, complicated cigar that, um, that everybody can smoke, but it's totally different than this. I mean, I think it's going to... Um, that's going to be kind of more of a uh, like sometimes you have like a good meal and then to have like something that is at the end of the meal that is like, I don't know, like a dark chocolate notes yeah. to round yeah. it out, to put like a little sort of period to the end of your kind of meal is nice. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, I got into the um, like differences of like, you know, percentages of, of cacao, you know, and, and how that's different. Mm -hmm. And I would say that this next cigar has more of that kind of bit of a the cacao kind of uh flavors that that are going to be i mean it's not going to be all about that but you're going to be able to pick that up yeah so it's almost like that would be a nice cigar at kind of the end of your meal to have mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um but i mean I, I do find it interesting that like um we like to uh ferment the tobaccos so that the tar and the nicotine content doesn't get in the way of what the maximum potential you can get from every leaf of tobacco that's in the cigar. So therefore, it should burn very nicely, um, have a nice kind of tight carbon ring, no issues with draw, which you don't with these, which has always been very right. important to us. But also that you have like, you're, you're getting like the um, A, if the tobacco is an A, A plus quality tobacco, which is what we're using, that you're tasting that, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting anything that is kind of impeding or getting in the way of the flavor. Right. So vis-a-vis, -vis, it might be uh, complex and layered, but not one that you're going to all of a sudden have to sit down because it's just too hot, too heavy on the nicotine content. Yeah. Yeah. So, like back in the, the boom days, like in the mid to late nineties, it was almost a given that you'd have to, you'd buy a box of cigars and you have to Oh, you got to let it sit for however long, right? Because the cigars weren't as well aged. The tobaccos weren't fermented properly. Mm -hmm. But I think now the stuff that we're making is it's ready to smoke right off the truck. You know what yeah. I mean? Because it's it should be. And that's, you know, you take a little bit longer. You spend a little bit more time on the back end and the agricultural aspect of it. And you get a better finished product. Some of the uh, interesting commentary I've heard like during the last few months is that remember we were down in uh, Dominican Republic with our team. And, uh, I mean, when you're, when you're down there, you're smoking a lot of cigars. Oh yeah. So some of our guys went out and they were, they were able to buy, um, uh, I think it was like Quintero, maybe some Cuban cigars that were like, you know, sandwich fill mm -hmm. and, uh, and someone smoked a Quintero and, and got pretty, almost like threw up, you know, after <laughs> who like, was it? You can tell you can name names. It was Cole. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> really? Was filming this. Oh, wow. Um, your initiation but, I mean, Cole, trial by fire. Was like it was an initiation. He okay. even had Hamastron that he blew out of his nose. Oh. He retrohaled, and I thought he was almost going to throw up there. That, that was a that's a video that should find its way to, to the ground. A little nicotine poisoning. But, uh, but I mean, like, and then the conversation happened that, like, well, maybe the reason why because he'd been smoking cigars literally for like forty eight hours. So I mean, by that point in time, he's used to it, right? I mean, his body has the constitution. But I mean, once when, when throwing that, he had a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And so part of the discussion went on like, well, perhaps since that is a sandwich fill, 
he was smoking some some tobaccos that hadn't been maybe uh, fermented um, quite, uh, yeah, quite like they maybe they should have, let's say. Yeah, sure. And because of that, they had a higher nicotine content, and then that caused that reaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I have no way of knowing if that is a true hypothesis or not. I mean, it, it actually logically, it makes sense because... Or it why just could have been the culmination have, of all of the maybe, cigars to that point. That was the tipping perhaps, point. I don't perhaps. know. I've only had one cigar. Since, I've been smoking cigars since you know I started back at CAO, but I only had one cigar in the last 26, seven years that made me get like, oh, God, I think I might get sick. I didn't get sick, but I thought I was going to get sick. And ironically, that I'll never forget that cigar. It was an Opus X Power Ranger, Opus ah. X to the third. So a little tiny, like look like a bullet. But They're man. supposed to be strong, though. Yeah, that yeah. thing was just a... I mean, it was a it was a great cigar, but it just really got me like nauseous. Yeah, and, yeah. But never since then, and I've smoked a ton of stuff. But that was the only one. Well, no, I remember I was um, actually when I was living in L.A. Mm-hmm. and I first I did my first cigar event was at a place called um, Cigar Company in Pasadena, California, and um, and then I remember like I was driving. I mean, I had like this is right when I'm out of college, so I'm in a Toyota Corolla on the 101. And I'm smoking like a Dunhill Maduro, and I had to pull over and throw up. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, I was brutal wow. on the side of the freeway. <laughs> pulled over God. And throw up. Yeah, because I just yeah I don't know. I mean, I wasn't it just hit you different. It just hit me different. Yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't. First of all, I wasn't used to it. And know? a lot depends on if you, what you've smoker. eaten or what you have not eaten, and all of those things go into it as well. Yeah, you know? but but that wasn't a pleasant uh, feeling because I, no. I don't feel that when I no. smoke cigars. No. I remember George Brightman told me he's like a cigar should be something you enjoy, not a challenge to get through it. You know what I mean? And. There was a, a time and a place where, like, all the cigars were coming out that were, you just had to be stronger and stronger and stronger, remember? And it just got to a point where, like, okay, let's dial it back a little bit, go back to what, you know, because a lot of people think, like, for instance, like Cubans, I always thought when I was just starting out, like, Cubans are strong cigars. But once you start smoking real Cuban cigars, you realize they're not strong. A good Cuban cigar is like floral, it's, it's got, you know, notes of tea and, and some, some leather, and it's just complex and it's enjoyable. It's yeah. not like a lot of the what I call domestic cigars that are being made. Sometimes they just they just sometimes they under ferment on purpose. Yeah, to give that illusion of strength. That's and, right. And people are like, oh wow, well, yeah, that was a great cigar. It made me sweat and oh, but that's. And I don't like those. I don't like that at all. That's not my thing at all. It's it should be again going back to Brightman. It should be something that you enjoy, and it's you you savor it. You know, it's not. I mean, it's like it's like wine, right? I mean, you just want to like it's differences of like kind of. Body complexity. Mm-hmm. What are the combinations that you're using? I mean, we had again. We did this experiment with uh, Ernesto down there, where he was taking like uh, 100% of all the tobaccos that he had in inventory, and uh, trying what they were individually and what they tasted like, and then combining them. And I was like, well, you know, we use the cooking analogy, and Ernesto was like, oh yeah, it's like it's like cooking. Yeah, you're combining these kind of spices to try to figure out what's your what's the kind of the flavor that you're going for with that, you know. So it's a. Um, Did you smoke any actual like samples, like fully finished samples down there that you you went, wow, this is really good. Mm. I would say not really. I mean, like it was really the highlight of it was smoking the individual tobaccos yeah. and trying to like identify what they taste like on their own, and then you know the other challenge is trying to figure out like you know then then what is that from a proportional standpoint that you put together to right. come up with the blend, you know. I mean, in the uh, past, I've gone down there by myself or with Mike or whatever, and like once in a while, Ernie will slip me a cigar and smoke this. And I'll be like, "What's in it? Don't worry about it. Just smoke it." You know what I mean? And <laughs> sometimes it's like, "Okay, it was okay," but sometimes it's like, "What the is in this thing? What is this?" You know, that kind of a thing. So I always kind of get excited about that. What was what was the idea behind the uh, the LE, the most recent LE that you came up? Pastelitos. With? Yeah, the idea was just a short format cigar, really. It was just we ideally like we wanted to come up with something usually in Q1 that's like a shorter cigar that that gives it a lot of flavor and, and impact and um we had done a, we've done like shots minutos all that kind of stuff and I wanted to do something with Karim and um I said let's try it. we started messing around with like 4 by 50 4 by 52 454 456 I wanted it short with a pigtail landed on the 454 and smoked really good put a little pigtail on it just for a little flourish and um, I guess, you know, people bought it sight unseen. We're supposed to get them 
I think mid March we'll start shipping them. So by the time we shoot this next one, I think they're uh, they'll probably start hitting the marketplace. But now, it's just a fun little project. Now tell me about like um, and I mean I don't want to let the the you know the um, the cat out of the, the bag. Mil, the cat out of the bag, but um, with Mil Diaz, you also have like a similar kind of. Yeah, project. yeah, yeah. We're we're that's in production right now. Again, by the, just probably a week after this airs, we're going to be announcing it. But. Um, you know, for a lot of uh, reasons that we won't go into here, we kind of took our foot off the gas on Mil Diaz the second half of 22. Um, really stopped promoting it. Just kind of really stopped giving it any attention or shine. And in retrospect, maybe it was a mistake. I don't know. But anyway. That's a well-liked blend. Well-liked. It's kind very, of, it's, you know, it's, very nice. We got nothing but good things to say. I mean, that was the one cigar that we launched, not at a trade show, that just by organically word of mouth just took off for yeah. us and it really was a was a horse for us and then middle of 22 we we're just like okay hold on you know for again reasons we won't go into um but yeah we've got an le coming up for mil Diaz. it's just kind of a way of saying okay look it hasn't gone anywhere it's back it's here it is and we're going to start focusing back on that brand um with a radio so i'm excited for that one really excited it's a sexy little project it's fun. Yeah, that cigar has like it's very accessible. It's like really yes. enjoyable. I yeah, mean, yeah. To your really to your point, nice. like the foundation, Bosphorus being the foundation, it, it, that's one of those cigars where like you can smoke it in the morning, you can smoke it in the afternoon, after dinner, whatever. It's it's easily approachable, easily accessible, easily smokable, nuanced, complex. Um, just a, a really good, not a you know a banger or like something that's going to hit you in the teeth. It's just a really enjoyable cigar. It's, it's more where my palette is kind of yeah, yeah, yeah you know evolved towards um so yeah we'll see but then we've got a lot of stuff coming out i mean i wish we can get into it more but again the timing of these pods um by the time you know maybe the episode four or five comes out we could talk more about that stuff yeah um yeah. and then we'll be heading out to taa uh end of march for at casa de campo which is i, I look forward to that one man it's just yeah. good that'll be your first taa and she's a long time yeah long. yeah 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 yeah, that'll be that'll be. Uh, you'll have a good time. That was fun. Yeah, back at CAA, I always wanted. God, I wish I could go to TAA. Where well, these guys have so much fun at TAA, <laughs> and then you guys would come back with all these stories and stuff. And uh, but yeah, it's I, I look forward to that one. That one's a lot different than the PCA, right? Because PCA, yeah. you go and as soon as you hit the trade show floor, I tell people it's like somebody puts you in a blender, turn it on, liquefy for three and a half days, and then you're poured out at the end, and you're just like, you know. But TAA, it's like. It's really like nice social aspect. You could do whatever you want. Right. You, you could play golf. You could go do whatever, go to a dinner, what have you. And then the last day you do work and that's it. Yeah. It's kind of nice. It's a little more relaxed of a show, I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, it's interesting. We'll see. I mean, you know, getting into those, uh, um, that cycle of, uh, uh, you know, going to these, these different kind of events and seeing how they're similar or how they're different. Uh, I, I think my perception is, is that, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, um, obviously that changed a lot of people's rhythms and mm -hmm. how they were like going about their business or their lives. But I think a lot of people rediscovered uh, cigars or, or, you know what I mean? I think cigars were a sector that Exploded. came out as kind of like a, uh, um, you know, a segment that people found more time that they could explore and enjoy cigars. I mean, I think so, our, no doubt our industry benefited from the pandemic, you yeah. know? I mean, other industries got hit hard, like, you know, transportation, hospitality, but I would say spirits, cigars, you know, people had more time to sit at home. It really actually increased uh, our sales for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, I think that to see how these kind of events, now that they're picking up, mm -hmm. um, things are normalizing a bit more now, um, what happens with those relative to you know, people coming out of the pandemic and, and now reacclimating in a, in a renewed sort of yeah interest and curiosity about cigars and, and discovering those. And if, I mean, if nothing else, I find that like to go back to uh, opportunities for people to get together and convene and connect, reconnect with one another. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's why I'm seeing that when I'm going out is that like people are uh, enjoying getting back together yeah and smoking cigars and, and, you know, enjoying, you know, libations with one another is that it just, it's a good excuse to reconvene and reconnect with people. 
So that's what's great about cigars is cigars are a great kind of, um, I don't want to call them peace pipes, but kind of almost like a way that people can bring down the temperature and really get to know one another. I've always called called cigars like the common denominator because it's like you could be in a cigar lounge and be sitting across from, you could have a doctor, you could have a bricklayer, you could have a lawyer, you could have a garbage guy, but they'll all be talking about the same thing. Oh, what are you smoking? What what do you like? You know, and all of a sudden you have this common denominator that brings people together. It it erases all these, you know, socioeconomic barriers and people enjoy that process and it kind of brings people together. Yeah. There was a, um, there was some uh, talk in Nashville, you know, where we are is that, you know, the city and the state having some kind of tensions with one another. And um, there was a, a survey that went out and said, uh, well, what do you what do you all think about the the tensions between the city and the state? Because you know the city in Nashville is more, um, I would say, more uh, uh, maybe left leaning, and the state's more right leaning. Mm-hmm. And my experience with that, I actually commented. I never comment on these polls that go out, Smart. but I did comment this time. You know, which and I said, my experience is, if you get people in a room, and you have them smoke a cigar, and they drink a nice bourbon, yeah. Then it brings the temperature down, and then they can figure out some sort of common ground. Because at the end of the day, I think in this case, like the city and the state, they have actually more in common mm-hmm. than they do not. You know, like they both want prosperity uh, for the state and the city. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they both want better education for the state and for the city. They both want better roads. They right. want they want better uh, economic environment for everyone. You know, so, so how can you kind of, you know what I mean? So I think that there's more common ground and the stuff that people argue over uh, pales in comparison to the things that, that they have in common. Correct. And so I feel like that cigars, you know, spirits uh, are a good way for people to try to like, just find a commonality mm-hmm. where they can find other things that they have in common. And... I don't know. It's kind of a stimulant when you smoke cigars. So it it doesn't, it, when you're smoking a cigar, it doesn't make you want to fall asleep. It actually perks you up a little mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. So, so I think it's like neat. I think people are discovering that that is a, like you said, a common bond that gets different people from different kind of areas of life uh, at the, at the table. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think that's a good place to probably wrap up episode three. Yeah. And hopefully yeah. we'll bring other people in here that we can. Yeah. We can, at some we point. Can absolutely. Talk about that. Absolutely. Too. We'll bring the common denominator out on the table and we'll smoke some cigars that's and right. chit chat. So, all right. Well, thanks for sitting through with us. And uh, until the next one, keep smoking crown heads, keep smoking OFC. We'll see you on the next pod. Ciao.